Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I always start Tuesdays, I usually start Tuesdays with a bit of an announcement. Um, two things we're doing this summer for some of you who uh, I know are candidates for this. One is um, we really are making a hard push to address the weight loss and obesity and overweight issues among our population. Um, this is a pervasive problem. Most weight loss programs don't work. We think we know why. There are some things that do work and uh, a clue as to what works can be found in the weight loss registry, which is I think over 3,000 now people who have uh, documented that they have lost weight and kept it off and chronicled how they did it. And so that's a very important clue. And then some other great research we have on behavior that I think offers some great insight into how people become compulsive eaters, how they develop emotional attachments to eating and that sort of thing. So anyway, we have a great package right now that involves some private coaching, a certification course, um, interactive conference calls. So if you're a person who's frustrated with all this, the first thing that I'll tell you is we're not gonna spend a lot of time telling you you need to eat less and exercise more. And by the way, let's review the eating plan so that we're crystal clear on the low fat issue because we don't think that's gonna help you. We think you need a whole whole lot of other things to be addressed and that's what this program is all about. The other thing that I'll mention that we're doing this summer is um, we have an enormous amount of content and it's fabulous content I have to say. Uh, even if I say so myself because I created a lot of it if not most of it. Anyway people say to me sometimes I love your stuff. I just wish I could do all of it but economically I can't. We've created this annual pass program that will allow um, some of you to access more of our programming at a much lesser fee. And if you're interested in any of this stuff, just send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. All right, I'm going to start with um, uh, something that just breaks my heart, actually. We're going to talk about obese little children. And I don't think this is particularly shocking news, but according to a new study, obese first grade children are teased and bullied more than their normal weight peers. And the heavier the kids are, the more abuse they experience. Uh, this particular study involved 1,164 first graders, mostly from low income white families, about 20% from American Indian families. And of course, it's kind of timely since I was just talking about the weight loss issues, but kids who were severely obese in this study were teased more often, were seldom chosen as most favorite playmates, and were often identified, in fact, as the least favorite playmates by their peers. Obese kids were generally neglected by their classmates, while severely obese kids were actually overtly rejected by them. They were often described uh, by their teachers as being depressed. I don't think that's particularly shocking based on what I've just told you. They were more likely to have physical problems like pain and visited the school nurse more often than normal weight kids. The researchers reported that most likely the children's physical problems were related to, at least in part, their psychological stress. And the conclusion of the article was that obese kids suffer socially and economically, uh, or emotionally rather, eventually economically, I'll get to that in a minute, and their issues begin early in life. Actually, they start before first grade. Studies show that preschoolers are aware of fat bias. At a very, I like toddlers are aware of fat bias. And the consequences for kids of all ages go beyond just not being favorite playmates. Overweight kids, when interviewed, rate their quality of life as being similar to children who've been diagnosed with cancer. Now, if that doesn't break your heart, I don't know what will. Self-image is a major part of their problem. Overweight children think they're unattractive, and then this makes them more likely to be depressed, to develop eating disorders, to smoke, and to abuse alcohol. They don't grow out of it either. Adults who are overweight as children often, first of all, tend to carry their weight issues into adulthood, but they often have issues with self-esteem, and they often have difficulty achieving economic success. Even parents sometimes treat their overweight children differently. One study showed that parents of overweight girls don't spend as much money on their college education as parents of normal weight daughters. I think everybody cares about this issue. I don't know how you could not care. But I also think that the vast majority of people just don't know what to do. One obstacle is a reluctance on behalf of parents to upset their children even more by trying to discuss their weight and health issues, sometimes coupled with an irrational fear of inducing an eating disorder in response to intervention. 
Well, I think the first thing that parents need to realize is that their children already have an eating disorder, which is why they're obese. And also that rearing children involves helping them to learn to solve all kinds of problems, which range from difficulty with math in school, um, getting along with others, and then of course paying attention to their health. One of the most powerful things and influences on a child's weight status is the diet and lifestyle habits of parents. Conversion of the entire household over to an optimal diet and an active lifestyle with parents taking the lead is one of the most effective strategies for helping children to eat better and lose weight. Presenting change as a family project instead of focusing on the child's overweight status is much li less likely to be upsetting. In fact, the child's weight status never even needs to be discussed. We can just, the family can just say, you know, we've, we've decided we're going to pay attention to exercise, we're going to be eating differently around here. Everybody's doing it, not just the poor child who is expected often, I've seen, at an early age to keep from eating the candy in the house and the chips and the other stuff that are around. Additionally, something that we need to address is emotional eating can start very early, even at preschool age. And so parents who suspect that children are eating due to anxiety and stress and other related factors should consult with a good cognitive therapist who can work with the entire family to change the circumstances that lead to the eating response. Um, I recently read and covered in an advanced study class um, Marilyn Wedge's book called uh, A Disease Called Childhood. And um, it was about ADHD and um, the children, children who have difficulty with focus. And um, she said in her book that you can't solve this problem unless you solve the family problems that lead to some of the behavioral problems that the children are having. And I think that's the same thing here, is if a child is eating in response to circumstances, the whole family's got to participate in changing those circumstances. Well, the bottom line is the cost of not paying attention to this issue during childhood is significant. I mean, kids just don't outgrow their poor eating habits, the emotions that drive their eating behaviors, or the social, emotional, and physical impact that results from their weight status. You know, intervention is required, and sooner is better than later. Um, I guess uh, you know, I, I, it's easy to think it'll all just go away, but I'm sure you know mostly adults watching this we all are mature enough to know that most of our problems in life don't spontaneously resolve. We actually have to do something about them. So um, on behalf of kids, let's get motivated to change this. And, and once parents get on board, we're going to have a healthy household. We're going we're gonna to address this systemically. A gang of parents, I mean millions of parents across the country, can then place pressure on school systems and other areas that impact the child's life to try to start addressing this mess. All right, so on to another topic, and um, some of the things I'm covering these days come from really good questions I get from uh, readers of my newsletter and people who watch video clips. And um, I had a recent question about insulin-like growth factor. What is it? It gets mentioned all the time in cancer workshops. So uh, here is a little bit about insulin-like growth factor. They're actually insulin-like growth factors one and two are proteins produced by the liver, and their primary function is to stimulate the growth of cells and tissues in the body. They also have some effect on decreasing blood glucose levels, but much weaker than, than insulin. IGF-1 is involved in cellular growth and differentiation, mediates most of the action of pituitary growth hormone. It's how babies grow into children and children grow into adults. IGF-1 levels increase during childhood, they peak during adolescence, and then for the rest of your life on the planet, they've decreased gradually. While the liver is primarily responsible for uh, IGF-1 production, other tissues produce it, and some of those tissues also have IGF receptors. Serum binding proteins can inhibit the action of IGF proteins. Well, the role in IGF-1 in cancer development has been known for some time. In 2002, a study showed that higher plasma IGF-1 levels was associated with a higher incidence of prostate cancer, and higher levels of IGF-1 binding proteins were inversely associated. Other studies have shown a relationship between IGF-1 levels and breast, colorectal, lung, thyroid, bone, brain, and ovarian cancers. Lower levels of IGF-1 are associated with longer survival for cancer patients. The good news is that IGF-1 levels are related to diet, and dietary changes can lower plasma levels. Higher protein intake is associated with higher plasma levels of IGF-1. On the other side, lower protein intake is associated with lower plasma levels, 
lowered incidence of cancer and lower mortality in people under age 65. Other studies have confirmed the relationship between lowered protein intake and lower plasma IGF-1 levels, particularly animal protein. Whey, milk and whey protein intake increase IGF-1 levels significantly and the effect is stronger than for other types of animal protein, which explains why dairy intake is associated with so many different forms of cancer. A recent study showed that most cancers and deaths from cancer are preventable. The connection between diet, IGF-1 levels, and cancer confirm this. And it can never be said too many times, dietary change is the best protection against developing cancers, surviving cancer, and preventing a recurrence. It is always easier to prevent cancer than it is to treat it. And while some cancers respond well to treatment, many cancers not so much. Um, by the way, this article has 13 references, and, uh, if you, and people write to me all the time when they're intrigued with this stuff. How do I get the references? How do I get the articles? Subscribe to the Health Briefs Online Library. That's where we post these articles um, at the same time that they're delivered to you uh, via video clips. Um, so as usual, as we wrap up for Tuesday, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.